So I would invite you now to open up your Bibles to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. This chapter opens, you might remember, with a crowd of people following Jesus into the wilderness onto, on, uh, over onto the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. And this is a crowd that was not going to let this miracle worker get away from them. And so evening approached as Jesus taught. And he knew that these poor Galileans had nothing to eat. He knew the journey back to their home was way too long. And so he turns to Philip. One of his disciples who grew up right in that very area and asked, well, where can we buy some food? It was a test for Philip. Jesus already knew that he was going to feed these people miraculously. Well, Philip failed the test, just like we usually fail the test that God might give us. Instead of trusting Jesus, well, Philip showed off his head for numbers. He must have been good at math. He actually advised Jesus that a giant amount of money, and he threw out a quick calculation, but a giant amount of money couldn't buy enough bread for each person to have even just a little bit, Philip said. Well, then Andrew, another of Jesus' disciples, he brought a boy to Jesus. Now, that boy didn't have much, just a few loaves of bread and some fish. But the boy was willing to give them to Jesus, and he just gave them to Jesus. So let's read the rest of the story, verse 10. Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and, what he had, and, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. And when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. But perceiving that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. So I want to remind you that, that the main lesson of this miracle is that it foreshadows Jesus giving himself to save his people. It foreshadows that Jesus' body was broken and given for us. But beyond that main lesson that we see, man, this story really rewards us with some tremendous lessons. They're just worth our time and attention. So the first lesson presents a, a prominent feature that should be present in all of God's people. It's this. Obedience to Jesus distinguishes Christians from the people of the world. Obedience to Jesus. So with some little loaves and fish in his hands, Jesus tells the disciples to have this crowd of people sit down. Now, people of that day ate by reclining on one elbow. They just kind of laid down and, and reclined on that elbow and ate. And so it's very clear to these disciples, that's how they ate, it's clear to them that, that Jesus is actually proposing here to feed these thousands of people with that little bit of, little bit of food. It's ridiculous, and yet... They obeyed. These guys are confused, obviously, probably doubting, but they obediently arranged that giant crowd into organized groups, just as Jesus instructed. And you kind of wonder, at least I do, from their perspective, what, what's the use of making a hungry multitude of people sit down when there's nothing to feed them with? Ah, oh, but, but God had spoken. Christ gave the command, and really that was enough. And I'll just tell you this. When the Lord commands, it, it is for us just to obey. Not just, if he commands it, we obey. And we don't reason with him. We don't argue with him. We don't question with him. I wonder, why should Adam and Eve not eat of the tree of knowledge? Why? Simply because God had forbidden them to do it, right? You wonder, why should Noah in the absence of any signs of an approaching flood, why should he go to all the trouble of building the ark? Does anybody remember how long it took him? I mean, five days, five weeks, I mean, years. Why? Simply because God commanded him to do it. And, and so it is today. I mean, we wonder today, why should Christians be baptized? This old, why do we, you know, like when our church got hit by a tornado, did you know, we put a new baptismal tank back there. Our old one got all dented up and cracked. Why should Christians be baptized? You know, why should wives submit, submit to husbands? I mean, especially in these modern times that we live in. Why, why should we be not drunk with wine? 
Why should we deny ourselves all sorts of pleasures? Why should sweethearts wait until marriage? Why should we give our money to the church? Why? Simply because God has commanded these things. It just, it just right there it is. And what a helpful blessing it is in this story to observe the disciples' response to their, to their master's command. Now, their faith had failed, obviously, but their obedience didn't. And so their obedience then, really, if you look at it, their obedience, because they had everybody sit down, just like he said, had no faith, but they were being obedient. And really, their obedience gave evidence to the fact that their Christianity was genuine. In fact, Jesus says later in this very book, John 14, Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And the obvious point is there. If you don't, well, you don't love me. Now, a lot of people have the commandments, but do you obey them? He it is who loves me. So our faith, it is weak more than it's strong, isn't it? Our faith is often weak. But what is faith? It's always in, the, in an object. What's the object that you put your faith in? Christian, who, who is the object of our faith? It's the Lord Jesus. So our faith is weak. He's never weak. And sometimes when our faith is weak, though, it's like all that we can see is the giant multitude. All we can see is the meager bread and fish. But what we can always do, doesn't matter how weak your faith is, what you can always do is obey your master, the Lord Jesus Christ. So if your faith is weak today, I would say this, obedience. If your faith is weak, obedience is the best way to begin to strengthen it. Just do what God said to do. The second lesson is closely related. Divine reasons lie behind God's commandments. Reasons. God never does anything, ever, for no reason. So Jesus said, have the people sit down. Why sit down? Well, two reasons, I think. First, because God is a God of order. He's a God of order. You know, when God's people fled from captivity in Egypt, way back in Exodus, it's interesting. They didn't race out in a disorderly fashion. Let God get out! God, you know, it wasn't that. It's interesting. It's very organized. They came out in ranks of numbered groups. And it was the same thing when they get out in the wilderness and they began to, to make camp and then break camp when God would move them. God organized them into 12 tribes. God assigned particular campsites exactly around the tabernacle. He gave specific duties. So in other words, he gave these very particular instructions for which tribes would lead out, which tribes would follow, which tribes would be on the rear guard. It just and then it was the same. When, when that giant group of people, when God led them across the Jordan River to wage war, to take control of the promised land, very, very organized. And we just see all through the Bible that God is a God of order. And we see it right here on the mountainside in Galilee when Jesus organized that giant crowd of people into groups. And Mark's gospel really specifies, Mark tells us that Jesus had the disciples arrange them into groups of hundreds and fifties. So now imagine this crowd of 5,000. That's just the men, by the way. And Jesus has them very, very organized now. And just God's a God of order. And he hasn't changed in that. In fact, that reminds me in the New Testament when Paul wrote to the church that, that was in Corinth. And he wrote about the need for orderly worship. He said this, All things should be done decently and in order. And if you know anything about that church in Corinth, you can read about them in both of those Corinthian books in the New Testament, that there were just people praying out loud in church all at the same time. It was very chaotic. Other people were babbling in strange tongues and just claiming it all came from the Holy Spirit. Still others were drawing attention to themselves, standing up just all on their own and sharing revelations that they claim came directly from God right then. Women were asserting themselves in large and in charge fashion. And Paul said to the church, God is not a God of confusion. And I'll tell you this, when, when you see chaotic behavior in a church service, that is a sure sign that the Holy Spirit is not in control of that church. Not even a part of that. God is a God of order. But I think there's another reason, a second reason behind Jesus, have the people sit down, command. In fact, I think it's an important principle for our spiritual lives. It's this, we must sit down to be fed. We must sit down to be fed. Now think about it. All of the energy and all of the self-will of our sinful flesh, it has got to come to an end 
if we are going to receive the bread of life as our Savior. There is nobody that is going to hard charge their way into the kingdom. I'm going to do it my way. There's nobody that has come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. Nobody in the family of God who just said, I'm doing it my way. I'm coming in large and in charge. Ostentatious me. Look at me. I'm being true to myself. I'm following my heart. The worst thing in the world. I don't want to be inauthentic. Not one person in the kingdom like that. You must humble yourself. You must repent of your self-will, of your desire to run your own life. Repent of your rebellion against your maker. You must receive the gift of eternal life. And sitting down just perfectly captures that. In fact, all of us need to ask God to teach us to be quiet and sit still. I mean, especially in this crazy age that we live in when almost everybody is rushing around, right? Rushing here, rushing there. And, and, and this crazy age in which the standard of excellence now isn't how well a thing is done, but how quickly. Which is all frenetic, it's all fast, I want it right now. Also in this crazy age, when even the Lord's people are infected by this, this same spirit of haste. Wow, this is a timely word for us. And, and don't think for a second that we sinners have the power in ourselves to humbly comply with Jesus' command to sit and receive. Have you noticed that's not what we like to do naturally? It's interesting. We have to be made to sit down, just like it says right there. We have to be made. That reminds me of the 23rd Psalm, that famous Psalm where it says, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Because we're not prone to sit down and shut up and listen, are we? We're not at all. In fact, I think that's one reason that God actually sends sickness and suffering into his people's lives sometimes. He is making us sit down, maybe even lay down on our sick bed, so that we will finally hear from him. So boy, Joseph's going to get on me later, but so God gave my son Joseph a mouth. You're supposed to giggle at that. So God gave him a mouth. Now, everybody has a mouth. But you know what I mean by a mouth? Joseph loved to use his mouth. When, when he was a little boy, when I was disciplining him, you might think, how foolish, you know. Well, he's a chip off the old block. What Joseph hated more than any punishment that I was going to give him is when I would tell him, sit down, shut up, and listen to me. Blah, 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 blah. You know, there's always just, I, I, I said, sit down, shut up, and listen to me. Because what did he want? He wanted to voice his opinion. Like that was going to somehow change. But you don't know what I, you know, but, but, you know, he, he wanted to voice his opinion, right? And I'll tell you what, that's self-will, right? And, and that's what we give to God all the time. But God, you know, I don't want this, I don't want, and I don't feel this, and, you know. Well, God knows that we need to quit voicing and hearing the folly of our own hearts. Why would he want us to keep hearing that? What we need to hear is him. We need to hear him. And by the way, parents, uh, by the same token, your kids don't need to listen to the folly that comes up out of their own little sinful hearts. They don't need that. You certainly don't need to hear it. That's the dumbest thing in the world. You know that. You're listening to your kids spout off their stuff. Stop that. God gave you to teach them about his goodness and his truth and his wisdom. And they, don't, they don't know these things naturally. I need to remind you. No one comes to the Lord's wisdom and goodness and truth on their own. Nobody. They have to be taught these things by us. That's why God gave us to them. And have you also noticed, they don't usually like these things. They usually resist these things, resent these things. They don't want to hear them. It doesn't matter. That's why you make them sit down and listen. And you teach them. Well, you and I are children in God's family. And so we need to do the same thing. We need to just sit down quite a bit and hear from the Lord. So the next lesson is a beautiful little lesson. Third, there is nothing too little for God if it concerns his beloved children. Nothing too little. Did you notice John's little editorial comment in verse 10? Now there was much grass in the place. I mean, how gracious of the Holy Spirit to include that for us. It just reminds you that Nothing, nothing, however trifling and insignificant, is beneath God's notice. And we just see that the Holy Spirit recorded the most trifling little things, just trivial little things in Scripture. Sometimes it's just the number of cattle that some man might own. It doesn't have anything to do with the major lesson, nothing to do with the doctrine. 
But we, know, we can go back in the Old Testament. Oh, that dude, he had that many head of cattle. Or it'll tell us, oh, this is what this man did for a line of work. Here's his occupation. just want to remind you that God's eye is on every little circumstance, circumstance that is connected with your life. And so God, on that Galilean countryside that day, that mountainside rather, think about it. He, he ordered nature to provide a soft cushion of lush green grass. In fact, that's exactly how Mark described it in Mark 6.39. God provided just a lush green cushion of grass for that hungry crowd to sit down on. I mean, just a little thing. Pastor, that's just a little thing. Oh, let me tell you, sometimes it's the littlest things that bring the greatest comfort. Have you noticed that? And God knows that. I remember being way up in the Canadian wilderness one time. It was springtime and the weather turned just nasty, just windy and rainy and cold. We're traveling by canoe and by lunchtime we are just soaking wet and freezing. There's just a point where a rain suit doesn't even matter. You're just wet and cold. So we paddled ashore. We stretched a tarp between the trees. We huddle up underneath that to stay out of the rain. And we boiled some water. And each of us poured a cup of Lipton cup of soup. Now raise your hand. The last, anybody remember the last time you get Lipton? You know, not much, you know. I mean, right now, if you told me, hey, pastor, come over tonight. What are we having? Lipton cup of soup. I'd be like, kind of got plans already, you know. <laughs> but I'm telling you, that little thing in that moment. I can still picture that steaming cup of soup in my cold hand. I just wanted to wrap them around it. I, I, I can still recall the warmth and the safety and the joy that all flooded into each of us there, huddled underneath that little tarp, raining like cats and dogs out there. We all got a little bit of cup of soup, you know, just holding it and sipping it. Sometimes it's the littlest things that mean the most. And your Heavenly Father knows that and he loves you so much if you are his child I want to tell you right now I don't know what's going on in your life but he does and your heavenly father is already ordering things in his world he's providing for you some little nice little green cushion to sit on whatever that might represent for you and he's doing that because he loves you let's turn our attention quickly to a fourth lesson God loves to use human instruments to accomplish his will human instruments and we see this more clearly in Mark's account of this miracle because he tells us that Jesus, and I quote from Mark 6.41, Jesus said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. So, we learn here, Christ fed that hungry multitude through his disciples. They received the honor, they received the privilege of being God's fellow workers, as Paul calls all of us Christians in 1 Corinthians. So God provided the increase as that bread was multiplied, but the disciples received the honor and the joy of actually distributing it among those needy people. And God acts according to that very same principle today. I like Arthur Pink's turn of phrase. He's a wonderful commentator. He says, between the unsearchable riches of Christ and the hungry multitudes, there is room for consecrated service and ministry. He continues, It is the happy duty of every child of God to pass on to others that which the Lord in His grace has first given to them. Yea, this is one of the conditions of receiving more for ourselves. So let me just ask you, what, what has God multiplied and placed in your hands? What is it? Is it money? Possessions, time, talents, know-how, any number of things. And let me ask, are you, if you're honest, are you selfishly stashing all that away in your own little knapsack? Or are you feeding the hungry? Whatever that might represent for you right now. And let me say, don't worry that you're not going to have enough for, for you, right? Don't worry that, you, oh, I'm not going to have enough for me. Come on, God. You know, if I start giving it away to everybody else, I'm not going to have enough for me and mine. You cannot outgive God. Let me say it again because I need to hear that again. You cannot outgive God. And we see this clearly in Mark's original Greek grammar. We totally miss it in English. So here's what Mark wrote, Mark 6:41. He, that's Jesus, looked up to heaven and said a blessing. And you could put that one on the screen there so they can see that one, please. Mark 6:41. He looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. So now that word broke in Greek, we can't see it, something called aorist tense. Now that's neither here nor there, but the aorist tense in Greek is our past tense. 
past tense, right? That just describes an instantaneous act that took place in the past. Jesus broke the loaves. Past tense. Aorist in Greek. However, when Jesus gave them to the disciples, everything that he broke, when he gave them to the people, I mean to the disciples to set before the people, the word gave is in the imperfect tense. Now you need to know this about the Greek imperfect tense. That denotes the continuous action of something. So the action is not limited to an instantaneous moment in the past. It is an action that is taking place without any fixed end. Now here's why this little Greek grammar lesson is so important. It teaches us this. We can never outgive God. We can never outgive God. So here's what I mean. When the Lord blesses you by breaking some bread for you. Breaking. Aorist tense. Past tense. What I mean by that is he gives you something. He blesses you with something. He did it. It's in the past. You got it. You got it in your hand, right? And then you turn around and give. You give some of that blessing to somebody else. Imperfect tense. Continuous action. The lesson is you're never going to run out. So long as you're doing that, you're not going to run out. And you certainly won't be in need. God's just going to continue to funnel that. And there's always going to be enough for you because, and get this, when did the miracle happen? How many loaves of bread were there? You, you, you paying attention? Five. How many fish? Two. How many people? Men? Five thousand. Divided into groups of fifties and hundreds. When did the miracle take place? You know? Well, Jesus blessed and he broke. The miracle took place between the breaking and the giving. And so what Jesus blessed and handed to those disciples, what was it then? It was five loaves, two fish, but what they gave in turn to the multitude, my goodness, it was immeasurable. Who knows how much it was? And get this, there were plenty of leftovers. Raise your hand if you like leftovers. Man, we just, I love leftovers. I don't understand people who don't. And I'll get around to that. I'll give you a little tip, a little foreshadowing. We're going to talk about waste and what the Lord thinks about waste. I don't understand the people that's throwing out good food, you know. Um, I don't want to make too much of a point, but I like leftovers. If it's good food, I want to eat it again. Well, apparently Jesus thought the same thing because there's going to be plenty left over when you let the Lord use you. Verse 13, so they gathered them up. So these are the disciples. Jesus sends them out. Oh, the miracles happen. And they go out and they gather them up and they filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. So see the scene again. Jesus broke the bread. The disciples gave it all out. Everyone ate. And there's leftovers. I mean, how do you get a better meal than that? That's the perfect meal. Good food, blessed by the Lord, and leftovers. Well, how much? How much leftovers? Oh, we don't have to wonder. Each? Well, you, you tell me. How many apostles did Jesus call? Oh, wow, curiously. How many? Twelve. 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 Oh, wow. Twelve basketfuls. And who was picking up the leftovers, by the way, with their own little knapsack? Those twelve dudes, you know. Wow. Each of the twelve apostles filled his own basket with the leftovers. Exactly twelve baskets full of leftovers. You get the point. And do we not see a wonderful spiritual principle here? And it's this. We're never impoverished, but always enriched by giving to others. It's just a principle from our maker. So when you give, you don't need to be anxious that, oh, there's not going to be enough left for my needs. God will never allow a generous giver to be a loser. Ever. In fact, it is actually miserliness which really impoverishes us. It just turns us into little, selfish, inward turn, lonely, depressed people. This brings us to a related lesson, fifth. God's supply always perfectly matches demand. Supply matches demand. There, in other words, there's never inflation in God's economy. Here in America right now, we're facing inflation, right? Because we have too many dollars out in the economy chasing after too few goods. Demand is outpacing supply. But in God's economy, praise God, supply always perfectly matches demand. And we see that in this story with the distribution of the fish. John writes in verse 11, So also the fish, as much as they wanted. As much as they wanted. Oh, those are precious, precious words right there. Slow down when you read these gospel stories. Precious words. The supply stopped only with the demand. What did the people do? They ate as much as they wanted. Boy, now that's a glorious thing. We in America, though, we just get to eat. Well, really, we eat to excess, don't we? But that's another point. But the supply 
was as much as the demand. This reminds me back, you remember this story when Abraham interceded with God on behalf of the righteous people in Sodom? Well, righteous people that might be living there, Abraham says. And so you might remember God was going to destroy the entire city of Sodom along with everybody there. Abraham heard that. You know, just that human heart of compassion. You don't have to be a Christian to have a human heart of compassion. You just know, oh, there's a lot of people that are going to die there. Because he knows the Lord's power and he thinks, well, Lord, what if there are some, some believers there that we just don't know about as if God wouldn't know that. So Abraham says, says Lord, suppose there are 50 righteous people living there, Lord. And God, God said, well, I won't destroy it if I can find 50. Abraham's like, okay. Oh, but then he has, you know, kind of cautiously he approaches the Lord. But Lord, suppose there are 40 righteous people. And God met his request. Well, then Abraham kind of audaciously, fearfully goes on. Well, suppose there's 30. Yes, even if there's 30, Abraham. Abraham goes on, how about, how about 20? Or, or, or how about 10? And God never ceased to grant Abraham's demand until his asking ceased. God's supply always perfectly matches the demand. I think of Elisha's oil from 2 Kings 4. You know, so long as there were empty vessels in the land, God just kept on supplying oil in abundant supply. And the same thing happened right here on the mountain in Galilee. So long as there was a single person on that mountain that day who was still hungry, the supply of fish just kept on coming from the treasury of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think that's beautiful. In fact, that is grace, brothers and sisters. And that is what Jesus does for all of his people. As much as they wanted, John wrote. I would say to you, remember those precious words when you approach the throne of grace in prayer and you're doubting, you're hesitating. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Ask in faith as much as they wanted. Remember those precious words when you're facing trials in your life, when you're being tempted. And you're just pleading with God to give you the strength. I'm all alone in the wilderness. Give me the strength, God. As much as they wanted. Remember those words when you're grieving or when you're lonely. Your eyes are just red from all the endless tears. Maybe you're bending over the grave of your loved one. Your heart's breaking and all the hopes that you've had on earth are dying. Just remember these words and, and pour out your wounded spirit, your broken spirit to the Savior. Ask for his help. Ask for his strength. As much as they wanted, remember these precious words and get this, maybe when you're guilty and burdened by your load of sin, you did it. Even if you've been on a long road of ruin, even if you have been willful and deliberate in running from God, the Lord hears your agonized voice crying out for mercy. Christ said in John 6, whoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. Never cast them out. God's supply always perfectly matches demand. Well, let's close with a sixth and, final, sixth and final lesson. And this is our little lesson about waste. We probably uniquely need this. Refuse to waste that which the Lord provides. And I don't need to tell you that we today live in a throwaway culture. We are a throwaway culture. Everything's disposable, right? Even income, which often means that we waste our disposable income and save nothing. So a little history lesson, our country's affluence really came right after the end of World War II. That made extravagance possible. Extravagance wasn't even something that Americans could imagine prior to that war. But following that, we rapidly became the superpower. And just economically, just, I mean, we, a middle class emerges. And we now have disposable income. We can buy more than we need. You know, now we can actually buy what we want. Madison Avenue comes into existence and marketing and marketers begin to segment us into you know, niche markets. There's money to be made. And you know, we just, well, that's what happened. But, but talk to the generation that actually fought in World War II. They never wasted anything. Anything. I could walk into my grandfather's workshop and he was always ready to fix everything because he never wasted anything. It was unreal. And the depression really bred that mindset into that group. But it is also a spiritual principle. And we see it right here in this story. We read in verse 12. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. 
I want to remind you, there, there's abundance for everybody, right? God has just met the demand with perfect supply, abundance for everyone, and yet it's obviously very crucial for Jesus here. There's not going to be any waste. No waste. But what a rebuke on one hand for our throwaway culture. What a rebuke to us Christians who waste on ourselves the overabundance that God would have us give to others. Do you remember the days when parents made their kids eat everything they put on their plate? If you're old enough, you're going to go, eat what you put on your plate. And now we hear dietitians say, that's what made America fat, you know. And yet, let's just set that aside. But do you remember the days? Anybody, anybody's mom or dad or grandparent, you, you put it on your plate, eat it, you know. Me too. Pam and I were, you know, we were, we were picky. And, and Pam and I ended up at the table many, many times with spinach, something like that, laying on the plate. I mean, Parents already done eating. Our older brothers already done eating because they weren't picky. Pam and I are looking at each other. And you know what? You're not getting up until you finish. I'm looking at that spinach. You know, and I can remember this. It's going to get worse the colder it gets. I'm like, well, it was terrible when it was hot. <laughs> you know. And then sin nature comes out in me. You know, I'm looking around the corner, you know, stuff it off in the trash, cover it up, you know. Um, but parents would do that, right? Now, why did the parents of yesterday, yesteryear do that? Well, in yesteryear, they knew what it was to be hungry. And I'm talking about that, that depression generation. They knew what it was. They were thankful following the war. that They actually had food to put on their table. And what they knew, too, because these men had left places like Oklahoma farms and gone all the way over into Europe and into Africa and into Asia, and they had seen that much of the world is starving. And they knew that. The idea of their kids wasting food that was it was revolting to them. And they were also revolted by the idea of, of wasting human skill and effort. By what? By being lazy, refusing to work. Well, you want to get some old-timer mad, you let them see some you know, young buck sitting around. Sitting around? Get, I mean, there are some people who can sit next to a shovel in a hole all day. It just wouldn't bother them. You know? like, just say, can you not see the shovel and the hole are meant to go together? You know? And boy, they just sit there all day like next to a shovel. You know? And, and they, that generation cannot figure that out. Laziness to them is waste. And that's why the Bible, for, for instance, says, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not what? Eat. Eat. And, and that generation also was revolted by the idea of littering on God's green earth. Man, I made the mistake one time. Had a bunch of cousins on my mom's side of the family. We're all, and this is before the day, you know, my grandfather, I never knew him to have anything other than a pickup truck. And it's in the good old days when a pickup truck has a cab. You know what I mean? This is before the king cab, before the extended cab. What was a truck back then? Just a bench seat. And I'm telling you, of course, he's driving. There's no telling how many of us cousins are paying. Remember that? When you got somebody on your lap and then the little cousin on their lap and you're just in there. And if it's nice outside, you got them piled in the back. You know, what good old days, you know, when Papa could hit the brakes and four or five of us would fly out on the road. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, come back for the good old days. Yeah. But anyway, so we're all in the truck and I'm sitting there next to the driver's window. And, and if you're with Papa Boyle, that's my grandfather, he's always loading you up with candy and stuff, you know, so just, just he loved to do that. And there we are, and I made the mistake of rolling down my window, just throwing out the wrapper, whatever it was. I'm telling you, he unloaded on me with both barrels. And that's because littering, for that generation, that's what we would call today environmental pollution, right? Littering literally reduces the planet's ability to sustain to sustain life, which wastes God's good world. That's the point. They didn't always realize in the past that was a spiritual idea, but we get it right here. But I'll say this, gather up the leftover fragments. Jesus said that. That's a word that applies to us in many areas of our lives. And I will just say this just for the sake of time. The fragments that we might need to watch most are the fragments of our time. Our time. Because how often we waste these little fragments of time in our lives. Let me quote Pink one more time. Gather them up, he quotes Jesus. Your misspent moments. Your sluggish energies. Your cold affections. Your neglected duties. Gather them up and use them for his glory. I just simply say we could all stand to allow Jesus' words about waste to come to us. To make some changes in our lives. Well, would you please stand to your feet, bow your heads, and we'll close with prayer.
Father, praise you for what your son did on the Galilean mountainside that day. Thank you that Christ is a miracle worker. And thank you that his heart is compassionate towards hungry sinners such as us. Thank you that his compassion spills over abundantly, perfectly matching our needs. Thank you that he also loves to use us as he feeds his people. And God, forgive us for not trusting you to take care of us. Forgive us for re refusing to share what you have blessed and broken for us. Forgive us for wasting your blessings. Change our hearts, Lord. And if anyone here needs to, to sit down and receive the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ, may today be the day of their salvation. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.